Taylor Harwood Bellis is really crucial to that. It gets harder, especially at Wembley, because again, the pressure just gets to you. Actually, I think Leeds can sometimes struggle to open teams up. Sometimes managers do jump too early, but I could understand if he chose to go. He's probably been guilty of being a bit wasteful at times, but he's taken his game to a whole new level this mm. season. There's been a lot of um, forward-thinking possession-based coaches coming to the Championship. Welcome to the Sportsman Untitled and we've just enjoyed two thrilling playoff finals over the weekend. I enjoyed a game of headers and volleys wearing sunglasses, which is why I've got a cut on my nose because I got smacked in the face with a football. Um, but <laughs> Oxford and Crawley Town celebrated promotion. We're also going to preview the championship playoff final between Southampton and Leeds. I'm joined by Gab and Justin once again, but we've got a whole lot to look forward to. So let's get into it. Right, let's start with the League 2 playoff final. Crawley promote to League 1 Gab after a wonderful performance and a 2 0 win over Crew Alex. Um, Scott Lindsay's pulled together an incredible <sighs> squad there full of non league players, maybe yeah. signed in the summer. But, but how have they done it this season? Um, it's been phenomenal work. I think the quality of coaching is one thing. Um, Scott Lindsay's a coach who's always impressed me. I think he's um, been underestimated a little bit because of his um, coaching background. Perhaps it is not the most sort of um, uh, sort of high end, if you like. But I think there's certain circumstances behind that which we probably don't need to go into. But um, I think he's a fantastic coach. Um, I think he's a fantastic people person as well, the way that he connects with people as well um, from first-hand experience. Um, and then I think some of the patterns of play that we've seen from this Crawley side where you had Corey Adai stepping out into the right-back position, he's a goalkeeper by the way. Um, you know, I think that was a really interesting trend that we saw at Wembley. Um, and then I, I really want to talk about Liam Kelly's performance under the arch because um, he's he's only five foot six, so he's got such a low centre of gravity, mm. but that means that he's got such neat feet in tight areas and you, he has these moments where you think the ball comes to him and he's crowded by opposition players and you think, how is he going to get out of this one? And straight away he picks a pass that opens the game up completely. So I absolutely love Liam Kelly. I absolutely love Scott Lindsay and Crawley have been amazing and they've proven us all wrong. I know, favourites to get relegated at the start of the season. <laughs> a lot of people had, had written them off. Let's talk a bit more about Liam Kelly because he obviously scored that second goal with a pretty clever finish, I think. Most mm. shots in the game, most chances created. It was a... Wembley performance for the ages you look forward to seeing him in League One you reckon he can cope with that step up oh absolutely yeah I, this is someone who's played in the championship by the way and I think um, do you know what I think he struggled a little bit at previous clubs um uh, like Reading and Rochdale where um, I don't know that the team that he's been playing in has been as well coached as this Crawley side and maybe that has exposed other parts of his game that maybe aren't as strong in the eyes of some but I think the way that Crawley play just suits him so well and really brings out his best qualities so um, yeah I'm so excited to see him play under Scott Lindsay in League One tomorrow if, if Crawley can retain him. And Justin, Crew didn't really turn up in that final. We saw it similar with Bolton, to be honest, mm -hmm. in the League One final, which we'll talk about in a minute. Can you explain the kind of underperformance from those sort of teams on the big stage at Wembley when they've been working all season towards this? It's kind of a really disappointing finish, isn't it? No, it is. I mean, we've seen several teams not really turn up, and obviously we've got the big one this coming weekend as well, which, you know, it can, it can happen. You can freeze on the big stage. We see the favourites freeze all the time, whether it be an FA Cup final, Champions League final, whatever, you know, playing, it, playing at Wembley. It can it can swamp you. But um, I, I think what Gab was saying, you know, a well-coached side who've come into the playoffs late, who've come in with good form, emphatically win their second leg. You know, crew were always going to be, it was always going to swamp them a little bit. And obviously the way they, they, they got through as well, um, you know, maybe there's an energy zapping, a mental zapping of energy against Doncaster. Who knows? But yeah, you get to that, get to that Wembley, and you can freeze up. We've seen many, many a team do it. Doesn't matter how good you are, doesn't matter what form you're in. It's a one-off game, and it can, uh, you can pay the price. Certainly can. And let's move on to the League One playoff final. Oxford promote to the championship with a two-nil win. Josh Murphy with both of the goals. But let's talk about Bolton a little bit because you've had hands-on League One experience coming <laughs> up against them. This season, yeah. Ian Ever, very impressive for a lot of us. They've been improving season on season, promoted from League Two, lost in the semis last year, lost in the final this year. They seem to run out of ideas for me at Wembley. Would you kind of agree with that, Justin? No, absolutely. I mean, Oxford is so well drilled and well organised. Des Bucking did such a good job in, in nullifying Bolton's threats and just allowing them to have the ball. And obviously the goal that uh, Josh Murphy scored you know, fairly early on in the first half, 
it takes the wind out of your sails and then you're chasing the game a little bit and when you're coming up against a side who are so rigid and so difficult to break down it gets harder especially at Wembley because again the pressure just gets to you um, and I'm with, with, with Ian Everett and, and I mean he, he talks a really good game doesn't he he talks really good he's so confident and these teams do back it up but at the same time they fall in at another hurdle um, and it's you know so it's a repeat process now of what it feels like for Bolton. So it's a case of you know, where do they go from here? Who, you know, it's probably a conversation for another day. But it's um, you know it's, it's another failure in what has been a well backed well backed manager, a well backed side financially. I don't know about another failure because I still think if you look at Bolton's trajectory as a side, they've continued to make progress in um, what has been a, a difficult league where lots there's been lots of strong sides uh, like sort of Peterborough, Oxford, and. Um, uh, but uh, but I, can, I can sort of appreciate how it's frustrating for Bolton Wanderers who are, just feel like they're, they're ready to return to the championship and they were would have been ready in, in lots of different respects. And um, I think probably the lack of movement, certainly ahead of the ball, would be a real frustration for Bolton in terms of the player final because it's um, they had so much of the ball but um, and they've got some good ball players in midfield like Josh Sheehan, for instance, and um, Paris Magoma, the way he travels with it. But um, they need a bit more in terms of runners ahead of the ball and uh, to create space and I didn't really see that from Bolton um, in the playoff final so uh, I think that would be the big disappointment Are we expecting them to be challenging for top two again next season or can we expect a little bit of a drop off? I think we can expect them to challenge again. Um, I think League One's going to be brutal next season, yeah. by the way, because yeah. you've got uh, my team, Birmingham, coming into it. You've got Huddersfield coming down with Michael Duff, who's a fantastic manager. You've got uh, Rotherham appointing Steve Evans. Um, it's You've got the teams that have missed out via the playoffs. Um, and, um, and and lots of teams that would probably expect to get better as well from, from below that um, as well as some of the teams coming up from League 2 so I think it's going to be a really tough league but um, I think top 2 in the last couple of seasons I think um, top 2 has been sort of an ambition rather than expectation next season I think it's going to be the expectation yeah, yeah. happy to be out of that league I guess <laughs> next season from your point of view Justin. No, honestly, honestly I, I agree with Gab it's going to be brutal I mean you've got Nathan Jones um, Charlton Athletic as well next season, which is just they're gonna they're gonna annoy people. They're gonna get results, and it's gonna be the case for um, for yeah for League One. So yeah, happy to get out of it. I'm just feeling sorry for Gab having to go through it at Birmingham City because it's a stressful league to to be a part of. They should win more games than they lose next season. Birmingham. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <That's exactly. laughs> There's some um, folks on Des Buckingham and Oxford as well. A, a brilliant story. Boyhood Oxford fan celebrating at Wembley. But for me, the interesting tactical part was, was Mark Harris up from Oxford and his kind of role dropping deep to a kind of cut off the supply lines to Bolton's midfield yeah do you know what that's so interesting because um, I was actually envisaging the game as um, a battle between Mark Harris and Ricardo Santos and I felt like Ricardo Santos would have won that physical battle um, but I think that's probably the reason why Des Buckingham chose to drop Mark Harris a bit deeper and get on Josh Sheehan and try and stop him playing um, and, and by extension stop Bolton and then Oxford can hit um, hit them on those transitions with Josh Murphy and how dangerous he is um, so yeah I think it was a really strong game plan I think from Des Buckingham um, and I think dropping Mark Harris deeper was a stroke of genius and Josh Murphy star of the day wasn't he two goals I'm a bit surprised he had to drop down to league one level he played a, obviously at Cardiff and, and Norwich in the championship it seems as his brother's gone on to succeed at Newcastle United he's kind of had to take a step back and he seems to have really found his feet and this is probably the, the biggest performance of his, his season and career so far. Yeah, without, without doubt. Um, he, you know, he's a player who's always had supreme talent. I mean, Cardiff paid a lot of money for him when, he, when they brought him in from, from Norwich. So he's, he's clearly a talented player. Um, and, and sometimes, especially when you've got a, you know, a sibling who is doing very well. I mean, you just look at Jude Bellingham and Joe Bellingham. Yeah. You know, you've got to carve, carve a path out um, for yourself a little bit and maybe... Mm. Uh, maybe Josh Murphy was suffering uh, suffering a little bit with that, but now he's you know he's doing it. He's at a good club in Oxford. He's at, he's under a good manager in Des Buckingham as well, um, and he's got the chance to to perform once again in the championship because yeah, scoring you know a couple of goals at Wembley is just an incredible incredible moment in anybody's career. Uh, so to do that at that stage in his career, you know hopefully it propels him to to improve next season and keep going and carry on that momentum. And what do you think we can expect from Oxford in the championship next term? I think they'll probably start as one of the relegation favourites just because they are the League One playoff winners, but it could surprise a few people. Yeah, um, I think um, I'm intrigued at uh, how quickly it's all happened for Oxford because I think if you'd got to around 
March time, maybe people were asking questions a little bit. And uh, I do feel like that was premature because I don't think you can have the coaching career that Des Buckingham has had in India, in Australia, in, you know, you can probably name a country and, and he'll have probably managed in it <laughs> and had success as well. You, you don't do that um, without being a, a very good coach. Um, at the same time, I think it took him a little bit of time to get to grips with uh, with League One. Um, and um, so the championship is going to be a big step up for him, maybe a little bit more so than someone like John Mazzinio at uh, Oxford, who's um, at Portsmouth, sorry, who's, um, who's uh, been there for 18 months now. So it, um, it is all happening very quickly. But um, listen, he's nailed it on the big occasion. And um, I think he's done, um, yeah, he's done really well to get the airs up. And we saw a club like Plymouth, I think, quite a similar club in terms of what they were trying to achieve in the Championship this year. They actually did survive even with managerial change. Would you see Oxford's plan as kind of trying to replicate Plymouth this season? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the thing that benefited Plymouth was that you know, they brought in the lone players that they had in League One that was such a success like Morgan Whitaker and Ballymumba. Um, I think Oxford, you know, do they have the financial wiggle room that Plymouth had you know they spent a couple of million pounds on both of those players so it's whether or not they have that capability but they are so good at finding gems like Cameron Brannigan and you know and polishing them and making them you know the envy of many of the clubs mm. Elliot Moore's another one Mark Harris has been an, you know, a very good asset to Oxford this season he was he was pretty decent for Cardiff to be honest with you mm. you know a willing runner and, and whatnot an unselfish player so there's a, there's, there's a fair few players already at Oxford that are probably going to be subject of interest. You've only got to look at the likes of Rob Atkinson and Rob Dickey getting big money moves in, pre, in years gone by. Um, so there's, clear, there's clearly quality there and it's just whether or not they can handle the step up in amongst being at Oxford. Um, you yeah. know, and being a, um, you know, a, not an undercard, but a, a, an underdog, sorry. Um, they will be an underdog. Yeah. I, th I, th I think the expectation would be that there will be one, they yeah. will be one of the bottom six, I think. Yeah, but I think they've got the capability to step up because again, I think it's going to be a competitive championship. I don't think budgets really speak volumes anymore in the championship it's about how you run your club who you recruit and how good you're uh, or how, how talented your coach is certainly and from a team that's just got into the championship to uh, two teams trying to get out of the championship we know our playoff finalists now Southampton and Leeds both handsomely winning their second legs 3-0 mm. and 4-0 what did you make of the, the second legs first of all Gab? yeah I think both sides um, we'd sort of doubted both sides I, I don't remember mm. us sitting yeah. here before the playoffs talking about Leeds and Southampton with the level of confidence that um, they've now kind of justified in with those second leg performances but um, I think really um, both sides were well organised in the away legs and then in the home legs they've really shown what they can do um, I think uh, we were talking off air Justin about Southampton maybe passing a little bit longer at times and um, I think Taylor Harwood Bellis is really crucial to that yeah, because yeah. as much as they pop the ball around really nicely and that's great when you're ahead and you're managing the game sometimes you've got to take a bit more of a risk sometimes to open teams up and I, I would actually make Harwood Bellis one of Southampton's most important players just because the odd diagonal that he can play into maybe someone like an Adam Armstrong uh, or someone on the right channel I think that like David Brooks I think that makes a real difference to opening teams up so um, yeah Harwood Bellis is going to be the key one for me mm -hmm. that was No yeah I, I, I absolutely um, I mean you've got to look at his, how good he was at Burnley um, how quality is with his, his choice of passing as well that's a, that's a key thing you know he's not just passing out from the back I think it was Vestergaard or uh, one of Vestergaard or Wout Faust who had completed the most passes in the championship but you know they are just your box standard passing into a midfielder mm. sideways but Harwood Bellis is the ability to actually pick out you know a, a diagonal uh, which is again you alleviate pressure on yourself when you do that and sometimes a Southampton team sorry a Russell Martin team can create pressure for themselves you know the, the way they play out sometimes and I think that's going to be the key thing is, is how much how many risks they want to take because they've got a Daniel Farker side with a lot of youth up front with a lot of quality a lot of you know, ability to press and that's going to be a difficult one so if you've got someone who's willing to be a little bit more pragmatic like Howard Bellis and find fee at the same time it's going to be a key key thing in that big pitch at Wembley I think we've all seen the, the championship this season and we've known that there's been a clear top four Sam to finished on 87 points Leach finished on, on 90 and they both think get automatically promoted Justin there's almost an argument to be made that this could be the highest quality <laughs> playoff final we've ever seen well yeah it's, it's, it's incredible really I mean you've only got to take into account the budgets of both sides and the quality of players that they drop down with I know Southampton sold players I know Leeds let players go out as well but they still have an abundance of quality there Crescentio some of them shouldn't be playing in the championship I know he was a um, you know a squad player last season or in the Premier League for Leeds but he stepped down he's probably been one of the 
best technical players I've seen at championship level. And you've got Southampton, who I've got Adam Armstrong, who he's probably been guilty of being a w- wasteful at times, but he's taken his game to a whole new level this mm. season. He's been clinical in his, his, his thought process. He's been taking, you know, he's been creating um, chances rather than shooting when he's had the opportunity because that's what he's been guilty of at Blackburn in his, you know, in previous years. So they've both got, you know, teams who are just packed full of quality. It's it's you know, it's almost hard to decipher. I think this is it sounds kind of trivial, but this is going to be a, um, a game where the big difference is going to be how brave the managers are and how they want to play, because that's a big thing at, at Wembley. You've got to be a little bit more, um, I guess, smart. And we've seen Des Booking and being a prime example of that with Oxford. Would you agree with that? I yes, but I, I don't think Russ Martin will um, compromise too much of the way his sides play because I think whenever he's been, um, I, I think he's almost a little bit ironically for, for what I'm saying, he's almost a little bit defensive of his style <laughs> uh, because I think he he feels very passionately about the way his sides play in terms of keeping the ball and and being so possession dominant and um, I think that's how it's going to play out at Wembley I think they're going to circulate between um, Flynn Downs and get maybe get Will Smallbone a little bit further forward but um, I think um, that's going to be the, the way Southampton play whereas I think Leeds will try and turn them over and get um, release uh, Crescentio Somerville in those little pockets of space that might arise from maybe someone like Kyle Walker Peters inverting into midfield and some of the um, some of the options that come as a result of that. Interesting statistical quirk from the other playoff finals is that Oxford failed to beat Bolton twice over the regular season and then beat them in the playoff final. Crawley lost to Crew twice and then beat them in the playoff final. Now, Leeds have lost twice to Southampton in the regular <laughs> season, so are we just throwing all of it out the window for this playoff final, or, or can we take anything from those games? Because obviously their last meeting was only on the final day. Yeah, the, the omens are pointing <laughs> The omens are pointing towards Leeds, which is a probably uncomfortable reading for Southampton fans, but I think what Southampton have done is they've, they've proved that they're capable of competing with, with Leeds. You know, again, the, the, big, the big game on the final day of the season, Leeds needed to win to stay within touch of Ips, which I know it didn't matter in the end, but Southampton turned them over. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you know, it might take more of that mentality going into that playoff final. But as I say, it's it's a one-off game. It is really is a one-off game where it's, it's when it takes all. None of those, neither of those teams want to be in the championship again. Um, so you know they're going to have to you know, pull out the stops to to, to overcome each side. And as, uh, well, either side, and I think that's going to be um, you know it's going to be pivotal. But yeah, as I say the omens. The omens are pointing towards Leeds. And Daniel Farker. Whether or not he rubs rubs his hands at the thought of that stat, I don't know. But Russell Martin probably looking a bit nervous. A bit of confidence he can take into this one for Martin, I think. Um, let's talk on Southampton's tactics a bit more, Gab, because we saw them play three at the back um, in the mm. final game at, at Leeds, and then they played three at the back in the first leg against West Brom. Switched to four for the second leg to go a bit more attacking. What does he do here? Does he stick with the three, do you think, that was successful on the final day? Yeah, it's an interesting one because um, he's... He went with a three very much at uh, MK Dons when he was a manager there um, and often at Swansea as well. Um, But I think at Southampton what we've seen is more of a back four but with inverted fullbacks. So you'd sometimes see um, Kyle Walker-Peters sort of inverting and then maybe uh, at the left back, whether that's James Bree, whether that's... Um, uh, Liam Man- um, Ryan Manning even getting the Manning's Liam Manning there. if you exactly. do a good job <laughs> yeah I know yeah. he'd have to be he'd have to do a few runs to get into that side up today wouldn't he um, yeah I th- uh, so they play more inverted fullbacks this season so it's been interesting to see him uh, change tack a bit but um, I would guess that he probably goes with the four but the way his sides play it's so flexible and positions change so much it's almost hard to come up with a formation sometimes um, but yeah I, I do think Kyle Walker-Peters is going to be the key because he's such um, he's a bit of an athlete he's got a bit of the traditional fullback about him but he can also go inside as well I mean I think I think he's somewhat a footballer that wouldn't look out of place in the Europa League yeah, yeah. he's that he's that kind yeah, of calibre of player so um, I think he's going to really hold the key for Southampton There's a lot of players I think talking of Walker-Peters who if they lose this is their last game for the club I mean Walker-Peters yeah, sure. will get a, a Premier League move there's yeah. a ton of names on, on the uh, Leeds team you yeah. can say the same thing about does that bring an added pressure almost to them well the, uh, this sort of the mindset that was I was thinking about going into the playoff semi-finals is you know a lot of those Leeds players you know I wouldn't say they crumbled going into the end of the season with the final few games but they really yeah, they at one point they had automatics in their hands and they blew it in it essentially so it's a case of you know are these players mindful of that you know they, they're going to be playing in the top division elsewhere next season regardless of whether it's Leeds or in Serie A Premier League 
Ligue 1, La Liga or whatnot. So, you know, what is the mentality of those Leeds players going into 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 the playoff final? Are they are they going to be as up for it? You know, who knows? They probably are, but that's going to be in the back of their mind that they're going to have moves away in the summer, regardless of where they're where, where they're playing. Um, and it, it, might, it might be the same as Southampton, probably probably less so, other than the likes of Carl Walker, Peters, and maybe one or two more. But I think, especially with that Leeds team, there's going to be a lot of interest in Somerville, Nanto, um, Georgino Ruta as well. That might impact them going into it, but at the same time, I think you know the Leeds in a playoff final, you know, forty thousand Leeds fans backing it. I think it's going to change that mindset very, very quickly. And we talked a bit about this ahead of the kind of semi-finals and uh, talking about West Brom and their defensive nature and how that could work out for them in the playoffs. I was surprised to see that Leeds have conceded 20 goals fewer than than Southampton have in the regular season. I know there's been a lot of defensive mistakes. Do we think that gives them almost an edge in terms of it's a one-off game, it's a final, and, and they could take that confidence into it? But... We've just been talking about how good Southampton's defenders are. They've got three amazing centre-backs and Carl Walker-Peters. Sure, yeah. I think um, Leeds, I think, are the better organised side, definitely. I'm, I'm not overly surprised, actually, that their defensive record is much better because um, I think that their central midfield is pretty much based on providing that kind of protection. Um, and that's where, actually, I think Leeds can sometimes struggle to open teams up. Uh, if they're having if they're having to, I think mm-hmm. sometimes Kamara I, I look at and I think are you going to create an awful lot? Grills maybe a little bit more technical. He obviously scored a lovely free kick in that uh, second leg, but um, what I, was Angus and Gun doing there? Oh. By the way, who stood about three <laughs> yeah. yards the wrong side I know. of yeah. where he should be? Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of a bit of a Xavi Alonso kind of <laughs> Xavi Alonso kind of um, uh, opportunism, but. Um, yeah, I don't think Leeds have got loads of creativity in their midfield, or not as much as Southampton. No. Um, but I think that they uh, they are able to when they do come into the final third, they can be super dangerous. Whereas uh, I think for me, Southampton have got maybe a little bit more into way of someone like Flynn Downs. Yeah. You can go to him, and you know that he's going to create. Yeah, and I think this is where the tactical setup is going to be so key in that playoff final because I think Leeds probably more suited to playing a counter attacking a little bit more discipline, a little bit more rigidity about them than Southampton are. I think that's very obvious. So I think, you know, letting Southampton have the ball is going to suit Leeds more. But at the same time, I think we saw a more direct Southampton against West Brom. So again, if they if they, if they carry that into into the playoff final, again, it probably changes Daniel Farkas thinking a little bit. But this is why it's such a you know an odd tactical battle because both sides have got so much attacking talent, you expect them to tap into that. But actually, I think it's going to be the team that carries their discipline the most defensively is, 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 I mean it's probably an obvious statement to make but both sides have the ability to score goals both sides have the ability to concede them as we saw Leeds in the final few weeks of the season so yeah I think that's where, that's where the tactical battle comes into it is, is, is you know, who's got the discipline defensively to, to maintain it for 90 minutes at Wembley Do you think Joel Pirro has to start for Leeds in this one I mean he's been a player that has come more into the team he's been in and out recently for me he's He's absolutely brilliant. I can't really understand why he's not starting every single week, first name on the team sheet. Yeah, he's, 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 he's an interesting player. I don't think he quite suits the Daniel Farker mould. I don't think he has the movement like a team Pou- movement team in Pookie had, mm, yeah. for example. But at the same time, he's so technically gifted. Um, and he's not an out-and-out number nine. He likes to take spaces in and around the 18-yard box. He likes to play a little bit deeper. So I think that's where he probably you know comes up short in that Daniel Farker side. But... He's the most naturally gifted goal scorer in that lead side. We see Pat, Patrick Bamford miss a lot of chances, whether he's fit for the final or not is another question, but he misses a lot of chances as well. And Matteo Joseph is just far too raw to be starting in a Wembley playoff final. So, you know, you leave Joel Pirro there. Um, you yeah, know, he's, he's the man who's got to start. And he, you know, he took his goal really well against uh, Norwich as well, which is a confidence boost. Yeah, I think um, Jorginho Ruta definitely carries more elements of the team Ipuki than mm. Justin mentioned there because he is so selfless. Um, and uh, he did manage to get on at the, the back stick for the third goal, I think, um, uh, in the second leg. But um, yeah, I, th- I think Patrick Bamford has played under Marcelo Bielsa, so he's got a bit more of the idea that's required from a modern centre forward. And then I think that brings me to the dilemma with Joel Perrault, which is he's not really an out-and-out number nine. He doesn't really have the sort of selflessness that possibly um, a Jorginho Ruta has. And then if you play him in a number 10, um, the, is he creative enough for that, yeah. you could argue, because he's so goal-oriented. So is he? does he have incredible skills and is he super technical and can he really finish, best finisher at Leeds? Absolutely, but I think sometimes in football it's about more than that, and I don't know. Sometimes I struggle to see where Piro fits in. 
there's that whole debate that Fark had to deal with in press conferences earlier in the season of playing Ruta as the number 10 and Piro up front and Leeds fans thought it should be the other way around mm. and he managed to deal with that and obviously he's got them where they are today but it's going to be a very interesting final which brings me to our playoff final predictions <laughs> I want some score predictions for you a bit of how the game's going to pan out as well um, Gab do you want to take to the floor first? Uh, oh, the floor. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to say 3 1 to Leeds. I think uh, I, I do agree with Justin in that I think Southampton might pa- pa- play a few longer passes in some of their game uh, to some extent, but I still think they're going to be wide open and I've kind of had my doubts about them defensively all season. So for me, I think Leeds are going to cut them open with Somerville, with. Um, uh, Jorginho Ruta and um, and with Willie Nonto as well I think his pace could be could be huge so 3-1 to Leeds for me I will I will back a Leeds win I'll probably go a more KJ game just because it's Wembley it's playoff final I, it's very difficult to see teams running away with it so I'll go over 2-1 Leeds Leeds win and again it just for me I think the tan- tangibly it's very easy to just pick Leeds but it's intangible with Leeds that worry me you know Southampton take an early lead for example quiet mm. down their Leeds crowd nerves get into it you know we've all seen Leeds self-employed many and many a times it's a cliche now but they're the intangibles you do worry about with Leeds but at the same time they've got so much quality they've got Daniel Farker who is a born winner let's be honest especially at championship level he knows what it takes whereas Russell Martin still has an air of naivety about him um, and I think as, as Gab was alluding to uh, earlier on I think if he tries to persist with a possession base and maybe doesn't mix it up and be a little bit more um, direct at times like it was against West Brom I think Leeds will pick them apart especially on the break and I think that's where it's going to lie, lie for me is, is that counter attack which is, I think Leeds are a lot more clinical very, when it comes to slightly different and, and I think I think, <laughs> I think Southampton are going to win it um, all of, I mean all of our predictions so far have not come true so. <laughs> well if I pick Southampton and you guys pick Leeds then one of us has got to be right haven't <laughs> exactly, yeah. I think Potentially, uh, championship playoff finals aren't entertaining games, aren't they? And I know we've got two of the best attacks. Do, does anyone league. remember Reading against Huddersfield in 20, uh, to, yeah. 2017? Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it'll be quite that bad, but I'll go for a narrow 1 0 Southampton win just because of that Leeds factor. They've never won a playoff campaign, and you're coming up against you know a very good Southampton team. I've said from the start I think Southampton will win the playoffs, so I won't change my mind here. I'll go Southampton, you guys go Leeds, and one of us will be right at least. (laughs) Right, we've done our playoff final predictions, very much looking forward to that one, but there's a bit of a managerial potential merry-go-round going on from the Championship teams this summer, or even Premier League, actually, should I say, (laughs) because Roberto De Zerbi's left Brighton, and the odds-on favourite currently is Ipswich Town's Kieran McKenna. Um, Justin? Can you see him taking that job and leaving Ipswich in the lurch, having secured a double promotion? I want to say no, but at the same time, Brighton's such an attractive job, especially from a, you know, if you're just talking from a career point of view, a management career point of view, no, no sort of love there for football clubs or anything like that. You know, career-wise, it's such a good move because of how well things are set up at Brighton. You get given such a license to express a team. And I think as well as that, you know, what we've seen with Ipswich this season is just an all-out ability to attack teams and keep going. So if you you know try that you know, implement that out of Brighton, it's going to be it's, you know it's going to be some interesting results. It's going to be great to watch. You know I think with Ipswich he's probably going to have to change things up a little bit, be a little bit more defensive. You know I think he's capable of doing it, but that Brighton job is so so attractive. Um, it'd be a difficult one to turn down. At the same time, do you want to leave a project in the middle of that project? I, you know, for me, you know, romantically, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to do that. I think Ipswich mm. are in a great position and in a, in a great trajectory as well. Yeah, do you want to leave that? No, but again, that's just a that's pure romance of, of, of football management. That is, it's not a it's not a career. A You're career interested. Decision. I'm interested that you've said that he's in the middle of a project with Ipswich because I think they would do well in the Premier League next season under him. Mm. But how much further can can they go? And I know Gab, you're very hot on on McKenna as well. Yeah. And you think he can go very high. Is is Brighton the club to, you know, he could he could potentially have European football with them if he does well next season? Mm. It, it's a great question because let's take the scenario that he does say, um, I've not finished my work at Ipswich yet, I want to manage them in the Premier League, which would be a perfectly reasonable approach. There'd probably would we say there'd be a fifty fifty chance of Ipswich staying up versus going down? Um, in which case uh, if Ipswich were to go down under Kieran McKenna, the offer of a Brighton wouldn't come back again. And for the sort of trajectory that he's on as a coach and as a manager, 
would he necessarily want to risk having a relegation on his CV versus going somewhere like Brighton, which he still might get relegated, but it would be, I don't know, a 2% chance or a 5% chance or whatever it is, certainly not a 50% chance. So I think Brighton would be a really big move in order to progress his career on the direction that um, I think he's capable of. Um, but I can also see Justin's point about sometimes managers do jump too early, but I could understand that if he chose to go. Yeah. Put yourself in his shoes right now. <laughs> the offer's on the table for Brighton. Are you are you taking it? I think I take it. I think, again, it's it's a risk, isn't it? Because if you say to it, which gets relegated, his stock might not be as high. It depends how they get relegated. You mm. know, if they get rele- relegated out of canter, he's definitely not going to get another job in the Premier League. But if they just about get relegated, if that makes sense, mm. then he probably will get a lot of interest. But, it, you know, it, it all comes down to that. And again, it, it's, it's a weird risk for Ipswich because if we look at their new ownership, Kieran McKenna was the... Other than Paul Cook, um, in the you know, initial stage, Kieran McKenna was the you know, very first manager they appointed. Can they go out and find another Kieran McKenna? That's that's another thing. They've got a you know, potentially big decision. They've probably got a long short list of managers, but it becomes a risk for them. You don't want to lose a manager who's guided you this far um, because of the you know, threat of, well, not the threat, but the potential of replacing him and not replacement not being as, or having as much quality. It's, it's, it's a risk, but I, I, if I'm Kieran McKenna, I do take it. It's nothing, it's Ipswich. I just think the Brighton project is just such a unique one, an incredible one. It'd be very difficult to turn down. I also think you've got to consider that I think eight of this Ipswich team played in on the final day in League One. Yeah. So this is very much a, a squad that's come up from League One. Mm. There's questions about whether they can do it in the Premier League again next season. If you then take out the manager that's guided them all this way, there's there's real alarm bells ringing for me. Would you agree with that? I think so. I mean, it depends who Ipswich can appoint. Um, I think uh, that's obviously the big the big question mark. But um, listen, I think they've. Um, well, it, it's, it hasn't just been Kieran McKenna. I rate him incredibly highly. I think he can go to the top level, Simon. But um, I also think Mark Ashton's done a great job as, as CEO. Um, I think that the structure at Ipswich Town is really strong. So I don't think those things can be underestimated either. Um, so I think they've got a lot uh, sort of going for them. Um, but I think it would be a, a big stretch versus someone like Leicester who have already got Premier League yeah. quality, proven quality in their ranks and maybe even to an extent to Leeds or Southampton as well. Yeah. I want to touch on, I think it was what you said earlier, Justin, in terms of where he could finish with Ipswich next season. Even if they finished 12th or something, is he going to get an offer better than Brighton in 12 months' time? Because I don't know if a Manchester United, whatever their situation is, or a Chelsea, Mm. I don't know if even finishing 12th in the Premier League with Ipswich will get you a better offer than what Brighton can offer you right now. Yeah. It's quite an interesting one. Well, I think the first thing you say is, is, is Manchester United a better offer than Brighton at the moment? Probably not. I mean, there are holes mm. in the stadium, for goodness sake, that lead to a lot of leaks. Um, and not only is that, you know, this, this squad's got holes in it, it's just a not a very well-run club. Whereas you go to Brighton, and I think they're on the precipice of, of really becoming a, a, a European challenger, you know, a bit like West Ham under David Moyes a couple of years ago. You know, they, they're really much, very much so on a, a you know, on an even field. I think with that sort of top eight, and it only takes. I think it's only going to take a you know, a little bit to, to get them over that line. Um, so at the same time, I think it's a, a better job than a lot of jobs uh, in, in Premier League. And they're not just a side who are just competing to be a Premier League club. You know, there are ambitions there to, to keep going and keep going. I think that's the key thing. Um, but you are right. I think you know what's What's further up than Brighton? You know, is it Manchester United? Is it a Newcastle? Is it you know mm. one of those sides? Yeah, who knows? But I think Brighton's actually probably more attractive job than, than most of those sort of top top eight clubs. And we also have to we're just talking about what ifs. Of course, is is part of our job because we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of days, next couple of hours. But if Ipswich do lose McKenna, they're obviously going to be a very attractive prospect for for a lot of managers. I think Rob Edwards is potentially a name that could be in the frame. If he fancies a job, he's impressed this season at Luton, got Premier League experience. Would you see Rob Edwards jumping at the Ipswich job? I don't think so, actually. I, I think if I was in Rob Edwards' shoes, I would stay at Luton for the championship and uh, try and sort of rebuild them because I think the connection that he's got with the club uh, is a really important thing. And I just that's just my instinct on it. Um, I was wondering about Graham Potter, actually, because whether whether he might be within sight for Ipswich now they're a Premier League club. That would be a very ambitious appointment, but he's been out of work for a long time. Yeah, well, I like that shout. Go on, Justin. No, I was going to say he's turned down pretty much everybody as well. So it's going to take a very special club to um, 
to, to, to coax him into a, a new job. But I think if one is going to remind him of a Brighton project, it's probably the Ipswich job. Um, but it's just whether or not he wants to manage um, you know, a team that's essentially built in League One in the Premier League, whether or not he sees that as too much of a risk. Or he might be holding out for the England job. I'm just speculating. Yeah, he's also had that taste of you know Champions League football yeah. with Chelsea. He's had that big club role. It would be a step down, obviously, yeah. from that. But you've got to jump back in somewhere, haven't you? So mm-hmm. maybe it's not the worst, worst shout in the world but like that. it is a very attractive job Ipswich and if you're going to throw managers hats in the rings I think Graham Potter is a very good name because of all the you know very variables Ipswich have got going for them like attractive football you know heart you know a club with a lot of heart and a good project as well and let's drop down to the championship and Ipswich's neighbours Norwich City getting rid of David Wagner just you know minutes basically after that 4-0 hammering at Ellen Road what was your initial reaction to that for me it, it was coming, wasn't it? Even though they made it into the playoffs. <laughs> yeah, um, I think there's always been um, a niggling doubt about Norwich this season. I think away from home this season they've been far too passive. Um, and at home, while they've had good results on paper that have got them into the playoffs, they've still been reliant on individualism. Whether you go to Johnny Rowe in the first couple of months of the season when he was outstanding, um, and well, he's been fantastic all season when he's been fit. Um, but certainly in the first couple of months of the season they really relied on him and then Borja signs, conjures things up out of nothing Josh Sargent returning and then Gabriel Sauer in midfield but I've never really or only very rarely looked at Norwich as a really cohesive, coherent footballing unit Um, and that's where I'd probably question David Wagner even with (coughs) the reasonable accomplishment of getting them into the top six Um, so yeah, I think um, think it's time for a refresh under uh, under, um, Ben Napper Interesting. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, what well, Gab said is, is is absolutely right. There's there's never been a clear style of play there, and I think if you've got a new sporting director coming in, the first thing they're going to want to establish is a clear philosophy, and it just isn't with David Wagner. I think he's a good tactician at times. Um, I think he, spe- he especially showed that at Huddersfield, but his job since then, you know, at uh, Schalke and Young Boys, haven't been fantastic. And he spelled with Norwich, although a good achievement getting into the playoffs. It's been one of you know fighting with the fans, disagreements with the fans, you know, there's been a lot of apathy at times from from supporters. So I think going into summer with a you know, fresh start, I think it's exactly what Norwich need. I think for me with Wagner is that I don't understand how you can be so positive and good at home. I think they have the third best home yeah. record and mm-hmm. the nineteenth or twentieth worst away mm-hmm. record, which is yeah. just you need to set your team up in a better way with mm-hmm. the players at your disposal. Mm-hmm. They finished in the playoffs partly due to the, the lack of quality I think in teams like Coventry who were chasing where there were losses towards the end of the season I think Norwich are also a fairly attractive championship club but and credit to Wagner for, for getting them to finish sixth yeah um, I think they've um, when we were talking about Norwich a few years ago maybe five years ago um, we were talking about a young exciting budding squad um, and now it's um, it's more like an, an ageing squad and to an extent some of it's been mentally drained by um, the challenges over the last few years and how they've kind of fallen back since um, winning their second championship title uh, under Daniel Farker in 2021. Um, and I think that, yeah, it needs a refresh a bit like what they had in the sort of mid to late 2010s when uh, Stuart Webber first came in and um, he brought the academy closer to the club and uh, and you had a few players coming through. And the, the good thing I think Norwich have really going in their favour now is their academy yeah. is actually in a really strong position. Yeah. They've got lots of players who have been doing well out on loan this season. They've got some really hot prospects in there. So I think they need a young, exciting coach with fresh ideas that can actually bring some of these young players into the squad. And, um, and yeah, just freshen things up a bit because I think that's what the club needs. Talking of the names in the frame, top three in the market at the moment are Carlos Cuesta, who I believe is an Ar- Arsenal uh, mm-hmm. youth coach, Will Still, and Liam Rosinha, who of course uh, left Hull at the end of the season. Any of them take your fancy there, Justin? Uh, I don't know too much about Carlos Cuesta, but if he's part of the Mikel Arteta coaching tree, you know, which is also Pep Guardiola coaching tree, prospect-wise it's going to be you know, fairly good, and philosophy-wise it's going to be good. And if he's got experience with young players, that's going to be useful. And, and also Na- Ben Na- Napa, yeah, the Napa link as well is going to be big, because obviously Napa was at Arsenal. Um, so there's going to be a familiarity there. Um, Liam Rossini, I think, for me, he's a very talented coach. So I think there are flaws in his style of play. If he gets given time and opportunity to work through those flaws, but like Russell Martin has, then I think he'll be a very, very good coach, especially at championship level. Um, 
so I think it's, it's I don't know a lot about Will Steel other than the obvious internet memes you um, know he played football manager yeah played football manager <laughs> yeah there's, there's a £10,000 fine or whatever so um, you know I don't know the, too much but obviously he's got a lot of stock um, backing him as well and he's going to have the pick of jobs this summer obviously Sunderland uh, is there as well so for me I think going for a young coach who's got experience of bringing those young players through like a Rossini potentially a Costco Esther as well is going to be a, a good start and you mentioned Sunderland there as well. Um, I completely forgot they were still looking for a manager, but <laughs> it feels like there's a few jobs opening up and a few opportunities for the likes of you know Steve Cooper as well, who, who wow, could yeah. be a could be an option as well. Um, Gab, how do you see Norwich uh, approaching this point? Um, yeah, I, th- I think very much along the lines of what Justin's been saying there. I think is really important. I think. Uh, really there's two people that hold the key to Norwich City's future right now and one of them is Ben Napper because he's the one person who brings a bit of hope in terms of the strategy for the club that's been that's kind of fallen away a little bit in the last couple of years so I think he's the one big source of hope and the other one is um, Mark at the Atlasios, Mark Atanasio, because um, as much as Delia Smith and Michael Wynn Jones have been fantastic um, ambassadors for Norwich City Football Club um, over the years, they're not getting any younger, um, and and they're probably running out of money a little bit. So that Norwich City are very much a self-funded football club, and the the way the financial climate of the Championship mm-hmm. is, that's not really sustainable if you want to try and challenge let alone get into the Premier League. So they need fresh capital to um, to, be, to invest in. Um, but part of it is actually developing a few players and selling them on. And I think that's got to be a huge part of um, of their model moving forward. Certainly, certainly. Let's just finish by talking about Steve Coop because he's a manager who got Nottingham Forest promoted and did fairly well in the Premier League. Do you think he'd be interested in one of these championship roles or is he waiting for another Premier League opportunity? I mean, I, I've always sort of linked him with Crystal Palace, but what Glasner's doing there is just otherworldly. They're going to win the league. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. It is, it's, unless, he, unless he goes to Bayern Munich, which, is a, which has been a link of recent weeks. But I think with Steve Cooper, I, I like him a lot. I, I like his... I like his philosophy in a sense that it's so disciplined, it's so hard to break down that you know you can find success in those teams. But I think the way the way football's progressed over, especially the last twelve months, weirdly, there's been a lot of um, forward-thinking, possession-based coaches coming to the championship, which actually leaves room for a manager who plays a slightly different way, and it's, that's going to get results. But I just think you know it depends where Steve Cooper's ambitions are because I think Forrest is just a powder keg of a job because of the owner, mm. because of the recruitment philosophy, whatever it is. Um, I think it's always going to be difficult. My question with that, though, Justin, is I almost, you know, sometimes you get a job interview and it's like, are you overqualified for the job? And I, I sort of feel a bit like that with Steve Cooper, where I think he's going to be very ambitious because of what he's done in his coaching and managerial career that I think he'll really see in the short term future, I want to be managing in the Premier League, and quite rightly. Um, but what I think Norwich City need is a coach that's actually willing to be a bit more patient um, and uh, maybe work with a possibly a lower budget um, and actually develop a few players because maybe as a as a club and as a squad maybe they're not quite ready for the Premier League just yet because when they have gone up they've um, they've been absolutely obliterated so for me I think they actually need to take the long term view with this appointment whereas maybe um, it would be the wrong time scale for someone like Steve Cooper It feels like a bit of a summer of change I mean they accumulated these players like Shane Duffy Jack Stacey yeah. Ashley Barnes yeah. a very experienced players which hasn't been the Norwich way over the last kind of few years and, and you're right in saying potentially this is a reset button it probably not going to go up next season but you know mm. two three years They've lost parachute payments, I think, for next season mm-hmm. as well. So it's going to be a really interesting kind of renewal for whoever whoever gets the job. There, okay? I, th- I think so. Yeah, uh, I think they they sort of went for the kind of big wages, free transfer kind of option with some of those players that you mentioned there, um, and that's kind of understandable in a way in terms of short term get players in who can help us compete for the playoffs. But actually, if you're taking the long view and saying, can we build a squad that's ready to try and compete in the Premier League and we've not got the lots of resources to do it, you've got to take a more developmental approach. And for me, that's the that's the direction that Norwich City have got to go in. Abu Kamara, who's been brilliantly on loan at Portsmouth uh, this season and won the League One title with them, get him in the team, you know, or... Possibly Selling Bally Mumba. I mean, I exactly. Yeah, that was, that yeah. Was. So Bally Mumba, I think, was a, was a bad call as well because it's focusing on the short term. And when clubs focus only on the short term aspect, 
that's where they can fall short. So for me, Norwich City have got to have a more of a radical approach to progressing some of their young players. You want to get Kenna Abo, who's a really talented player from their under-21s. He was supposedly hesitating over a contract decision because he wasn't sure whether Norwich City was the right club for him. That Norwich City have got to change that under Ben Napper, I think, Simon, um, if they want to if they want to move forward. And ask you one question to finish. We're very, very early in the summer. It's before the playoff final. But is there a team in the championship that you're particularly excited or positive about heading into next season? I think you're going to like my response. I'm going to go with Coventry. <laughs> so let's give you that tenor uh, yeah, after the yeah, show. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's the Mark Robbins factor for me and also their progression. You know, just strike me a little bit like Luton. I think being under new ownership as well is, is a big thing. They're showing a little bit more ambition. Their recruitment, although they did spend a lot of money, they had that money to spend because of Victor Giocarez and Gus Hamer funds coming in. But they spent it wisely. They spent it on young players. You know, we're just talking about Norwich long, uh, short term. You know, Coventry have very much built a squad that's going to be capable of competing mm-hmm. for promotion for two or three years down the line and potentially selling those players on. So I think the way they're set up now, they've got an you know, incredibly gifted starting eleven. They just need a little bit more depth and maybe one or two in that starting eleven, you know, swapping out for for new starters. Obviously, got to potentially replace Callum O'Hare if that contract's not going to mm-hmm. be signed, which. For me, I think it's probably an easier task than, than many will, will envisage it, mainly because you've got a player there who's suffered two long-term injuries, mm. who is still very talented, but he's suffered two long-term injuries. He's not the Callum O'Hare that was Callum O'Hare three or four years ago, um, but which I think is going to be much more replaceable. And they're very, they're very good at picking out loan players as well, Coventry. I mean, you've got Ian Markson, who's just you know, he's going to be playing in a Champions League final. Um, this this summer, you know, he's on the loan, only on loan a couple of seasons ago. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm liking the look of Coventry. I would, I would always back Coventry and Mark Robbins. Interestingly, you mentioned the lone players because that's been probably the biggest change under Doug King is mm-hmm. that last season in the playoff final, four out of our back five were all loanees, Callum Doyle, um, Brooke Norton, Cuffey, all of these loanees. This season we had one loanee, which was Louis Bink. So it seems like we're already going to be competitive, hopefully in the top six or top eight. Is that Coventry for you or are you be looking I, forward I, to I, I, I agree on Coventry, but I, I want to bring up Bristol City actually yeah. because yeah. Uh, I think they're cooking nicely under Liam Manning um, I think they've got when he's not playing left back when he's not South playing left back <laughs> he's got a busy schedule actually Liam Manning I don't know how he fits it all in um, but um, no I, I, what, what really strikes me about Bristol City is that they like the opposite of what I was talking about with Norwich they are investing in potential they're getting their top talents from the under 21s signed to long term deals they've signed Stokes who's a really talented player from Aldershot they probably won't feature much next season but it just shows that it's a club that's thinking a bit more about the long term um, and that's what really excites me about Bristol City so um, I'd, I'm thinking they might make some progress yeah playoffs potentially Bristol Poss- City. possibly early playoffs right right we're very much looking forward to the Championship Playoff final this weekend. Um, Leeds or Southampton will return to the Premier League. But thank you very much for joining me, Gab and Justin, once again. And we'll see you next time on the Sportsman Untitled.